Parsha 1-1, Parsha's Chukas. The name of this week's Torah portion comes from the second verse of the Torah portion. God spoke to Moshe and Aaron saying, This is the rule or law of the Torah which God has commanded. And the word Chukas, which is the word Chok, specifically refers to a rule or law of God that is absolutely beyond rationale. We can figure out nothing that makes sense about it. Of course, any mitzvah of the Torah is stems from God's wisdom and God, it's in, from infinity and in finite beings, we can't fully ever really comprehend even the ones that seem to make sense for to us, the ultimate reasoning behind it all, only God knows. But there is a, uh, there are mitzvot that are called chok that we can't even fathom the explanation for it. This one of this week's Torah portion, specifically King Solomon said about this one, that you know, all the other mitzvot I kind of figured out a reason for, but this one is, is absolutely beyond me. Now, this this week's Torah portion is going to cover a lot of different, it's going to cover a very large span of years, but very specific incidents within those times. Because after the rebellion of last, week, last week's Torah portion, the Jewish people stayed in the same place for 19 years. Then they journeyed for another 19 years with 17 stops in between until they finally came time to enter the land of Israel. But first, the Torah portion starts off in... Uh, in Nisan, the year 2449, so a year after the Exodus, before they moved on and everything else occurred. And this is the law of the red heifer, the paraduma. And God says you should take an un, an unblemished cow that's all red, can't have any other colors on it, a yoke was never put on it, and this is going to be the law of the paraduma. Part of what is so curious about this law of the paraduma mm. is that everybody, it is what they were doing was there was going to be this red heifer and they were going to burn it, not to sacrifice or anything like that. They're going to burn it all the way down and they were going to use it for purification for anyone who came in contact with a dead body. However, everybody who was involved with preparing it became impure, like ritually impure through the preparation. So this is the way it is. That's, again, this is why this is called a chok because ultimately we have to trust that even the mitzvahs that we do understand there's an ultimate divine purpose to all of it, and that is the true reason for why I fulfill the mitzvot. So, Elazar, who's Aaron's son, Elazar, he's going to oversee this whole process. And you got to take this cow. They say actually there's going to be 10 cows altogether, 10 of these perfectly red cows. Nine have been used until now, and the 10th one is going to be when Mashiach comes. But for this first one, Elazar is going to oversee the whole process, take the cow all the way out of the camp. And it's going to be sacrificed there, and it's going to be all the way burned. And in the fire of the burning, um, he's going to throw in a piece of cedar wood, um, some hessep, and some crimson wool. It's all going to be burned up in the fire. He's also going to take also all the blood, every all of it, everything. Well, before that, he was going to take some of the blood and sprinkle it toward the mishkan, or the tabernacle, and sprinkle some of it from his finger. But then after that, everything, 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 everything gets burned. There's nothing, none of it gets saved or eaten or anything like that. So it all becomes totally burned. Now. Whoever shafts the animal, whoever's going to burn it, whoever's going to collect the ash, and whoever's part of all this, they all become impure, and they have to immerse themselves in their clothing, clothing, and they cannot be pure again until uh, nightfall. Now, this is all important because, especially someone like a Lazar and any, if there's a priest involved in all this, or the priests who all are involved in all this, this means that they cannot go back into the Mishkan. They can't go back into the base of Mikdash until they're pure again. They cannot partake of the rituals or sacrifices or anything like that. So it's a big deal here that they're uh, they're basically taking a day off of their job, but it's the job they were born for. So that's part again part of why it's a hook. Um, now, after everything was burnt up, they were going to divide the ashes kind of into three parts. A third of it was going to be left outside the camp, and it was going to be mixed in for any of the future cows that they were going to do this whole thing with. There was going to be a third that was set outside of the courtyard of the tabernacle of the Mishkan, and that was going to be what was used for purifying. It had to be mixed with uh, spring water, and then they would have the purifying water, and that's how they would purify. And the third was going to be kept as a keepsake, it was called. This is always going to be uh, kept. So who who gets the ashes? <laughs> who gets to be purified through this? Is that anyone who touches a dead body, they're impure for seven days. Of course, since then, the laws of purity and impurity, they work slightly different, but there is impurity that's because we have no, there's no ashes of the red of the paraduma to be purified with, but this is the way it occurred. They'll be impure for seven days. On the th- that means they have to be totally separated, right? You can't go in, you can't partake of any sacrifice or anything like that for seven days, whoever this person was. 
Okay, go to the Mishkan or anything. It says even if someone would go into the Mishkan without going through the Torah ritual and they were impure, they could be punished with karis. That means the soul's going to be cut off, excision. So it's a big deal. Of course, it's very serious, all this stuff. So they're impure for seven days. And on the third day and the seventh day, they would be sprinkled with the ashen water. And then after that, once they did that, they, they go to mikvah and they could be pure again. Um, it talks about also that this person, while he's in the state of impurity, if he touches anyone, that person also becomes impure. But not for seven days, only until he has to go to mikvah, etc., but only until evening. Um, also, if someone, let's say if someone dies in a tent, anything or anyone within that tent also becomes impure. And it has to be sprinkled with the ashes, basically. Um, except for if there's an if there's an open earthenware vessel, etc. If it's not sealed closed. So there's all the different laws and rules about this, this stuff. Which actually have been mentioned several Torah portions before, but here's where the law of the Paraduma comes in. Um, so also... <laughs> Whoever carries the water for the sprinkling, once the the ashes have been mixed with water, whoever's going to carry that for um, for the one who's going to come to do the sprinkling, that person also becomes impure just from carrying the water. The one who sprinkles does not get the priest comes and he starts to sprinkle all the stuff. That's fine, but he's still okay. But he's going to take this hessa branch and he's going to dip it in. He's going to sprinkle the tent and the vessels. And if there's anybody touched a bone or a corpse or a grave, anything like that, lots of impurities going on. This is the law of the paraduma. So this is relayed. It's kind of a break now in the in the chronolog the chronology of events, in the chronolog all the the all the order of events that occurred, and now it's going to skip all the way to before the Jewish people are taken are going to enter the line of Israel. So we're now at the first of Nisan two four eight seven, almost a full, almost the full forty years later, and the Torah portion speaks now about Miriam passing, the passing of Miriam. They're going to be now, they're going to be at the border of Edom, the, of the land of the nation of Edom, who Edom is a descendant, it's Esau, Esau descendants, and a place called um, Kadesh. That's where they're at. And Merim passes away, and the well that followed the Jewish people throughout their journeys in the desert dried up because the well was in Merim's merit. So the people, what do you, what do you think the Jewish people did? They started complaining. We need water to drink. What's going to happen to us? So Moshe Davis to Hashem, God says, Moshe, Aaron, take the staff. Well, Moshe, you're going to take your staff, Moshe and Aaron, gather all the people, and go speak to the rock. Now, the rock, it was no longer a well anymore, so it went and rolled and went to hang out with all the other rocks. So when they went, they kind of made a mistake of which, you know, where's the rock? And the Jewish people were like, what's the matter? Just, you know, you just take any rock. And Moshe was like, you think that if I could just speak to any random rock, it's going to give water? Any random rock? Which... Isn't what happened, which is why they're going to go through this back and forth right now. Because Moshe couldn't find the rock. He spoke to the wrong r- wrong rock. The wrong rock. And it didn't give forth water. So the people start complaining. What? You know, what? Blah, blah, blah. And then Moshe starts getting all upset at them. Like, you know, enough already. And they're like, maybe you gotta hit it. Like, you you know, you hit it last time. So maybe you gotta hit it. So Moshe actually hit the rock twice. The first time was a trickle of water. He hit the rock again. And then water gushed for us. And all the people were happy they had the water. God, however, got upset. He said, Moshe, well, Moshe and Aaron, they were both considered, you know, in charge of this little operation. You had a chance to make what we call a big Kiddush Hashem, to sanctify my name by showing how this rock was going to listen when you spoke to it. Um, and instead you hid it. And therefore, this is now your punishment that you will not lead the Jewish people into the land of Israel. Now, if you remember back, there was a prophecy already that Moshe was not going to lead the people in and he kind of sort of knew it. But until this point, God was was still a little bit open to that decision being changed. But at this point, it became definitive. And it also was specifically stated in the Torah, it connects that Moshe and Aaron are not entering the land specifically because of this incident with the rock. Just to, so to make it known that it's not for any other reason. It has nothing to do with anything else that happened over the years or anything else that any of the Jewish other Jewish people may have been punished for for not entering the land. This is very specifically the reason for it. And a lot of it, part of the connection of what it is, is because as the leaders of the people, they should have been very, very much more tuned in to what their actions in public were going to relay. So it's one thing that Moshe sometimes had the back and forth with him and God, whatever that's going to be. But here he's standing before all the people and he has this chance to do God's will in a very specific way. And even though they still got the water and everything like that, it was not as God instructed 
And so God dealt with this a little bit more strictly. So now, okay, now Tor portion goes in. They're going to ready to go into the land of Israel, and they're going to want to cross through the land of, land of Edom. And they sent messengers. But just said, messenger said, please let us come through. We're just going to, we'll stick to the main road. We're not going to touch any of your stuff. And if you want any of your food or water, we're going to buy it from you. So it's going to be very profitable to have us coming through. And we're going to muzzle the animals and all that. And Adam basically said, no, if you come, we're, we're pulling out the swords and we're going to, we're coming after you. So they said, God is like, look, this is not the land that you're supposed to be conquering. This is the, that's the promised land. This is not included in the inheritance. So, all right, they all have, they're going to have, they have to go around the land of Edom. There was, that, there was also the land of Moab was coming up and sort of the same incident occurred and God's like, no, this is not the land to be conquering. You got to go around it. So basically three and a half months later, they got to, they got to trek around it. Now the Torah portion goes to the first of Av, the year 2487. And the Jewish people come to this place called Harahar. So there was a mountain on top of a mountain. And now it speaks about Aaron's passing. And Hashem tells Moshe, okay, you know, this is it. Um, comfort Aaron, say, Basically, unlike Moshe, whose children did not take over after him, neither of Moshe's sons took over the role of leadership, Moshe was able to tell Aaron, you're going to see your son inherit your office. So Moshe, Aaron, and Elazar, they went up the mountain, there was a cave, there was a bed, and a can, etc. You're going to dress Aaron in the clothing, and then you're going to take off the clothing, you're going to put the clothing of the priest, of the high priest. And then you're going to put on Elazar, so Aaron's going to see now that Elazar's taking over office, and then tell Aaron is going to lay down in this, this bed, and he's going to lay down relaxed. And it says that he died with God's kiss. It was a very peaceful passing that occurred. And then only Moshe and Elazar come back down the mountain and the Jewish people just couldn't believe it. How could the person, especially we saw last week's Torah portion, he had the incense and he fought off the angel of death. How could he be gone? And they had to see, they sort of had to see kind of like a vision of it of say, oh, he's, he really is gone. And it says very specifically that all the people mourned for Aaron for 30 days. Very specifically, not just because it was a great, man and leader, but very specifically because he concerned himself with trying to make peace between people, between if there was husband and wife, between friends who were fighting, he went out of his way to try to bring them back together. So this is something the entire people mourned his passing. Now, with Aaron's passing, one of the things that the Jewish people had throughout the years in the desert, in Aaron's merit, were the clouds on all sides. There was the cloud, the pillar that led them, there was fire at nighttime and the cloud during the day. And then there were the other clouds that surrounded them, that protected them from all the elements, protecting them from any attack, and like that. When Aaron passed away, the clouds went. And there was not like specifically a prayer for bringing them back because they're about to enter the land and, and the clouds were not going to be, that was kind of known, you know, the clouds, the, the time was up for this. Now, our lifelong enemy, Amalek, they decide to go for round two. Like, hey, the Jewish people are not protected. Let's go after them this time. And... That's the whole thing as a general idea. This is what the nation of Amalek, part of why it's so important, and we always have the constant reminder to wipe them out, is because they're always there to cool us down. This represents when we have a passion or excitement for something, we're going to do something good, and then something comes to rain on the parade, right? And there's no, that's one thing, that's that's what Amalek does. And that's part of why Amalek, in spiritual terms, is so dangerous, right? It takes away the excitement and the passion of things. The other thing that Amalek tries to do, and also symbolically, is to divide the holy from the material, like, hey, the real world is for real stuff. Leave the all of godness at the door kind of thing. Sort of connected to all this. You know, stop trying to bring your beliefs and your faith into regular living. That's part of also what Amalek tries to do. Um, again, which is why it's so important to totally eradicate Amalek. So what they did, their, their new genius plan, is that they were going to disguise themselves as people from Canaan, as Canaanites, and then we're going to go attack the Jewish people. And the Jewish people would be like, oh, God, please save us from the Canaanites. And then they would be defeated because it was really... Amalek, the Amalekites that were that were attacking them. That was their genius plan. But when they did attack the Jewish people, they kind of saw like they they look like Amaleks, but they're dressed they're dressed like Canaan. So they just pray to God, you know, as a generic prayer of please save us and please deliver them into our hands. And and they defeated Amalek. Now after that, the Torah portion goes to the next story, which is the story of the snakes. Basically, after everything that had happened, specifically you know, the death of Aaron. So Miriam passed away a couple months ago, and now you have Aaron's passing, and there's a lot of changes going on. A lot of people became very disheartened. And they were like, that's it, let's turn, we're going back to Egypt. We're going to go back around, and you have specific, the tribe of Levi try to fight them and bring them back. Like, no, where are you going? Stay here. But eventually they, turned, they did turn back around, but now they're, gonna, they have, they're filing their new set of complaints against Hashem and Moshe. About why are we stuck here? Why are we eating this food? All the, you know, the whole list of complaints. All the kvetching is going on. 
So God sent these venomous snakes to go and they bit the people, specifically a snake, because a snake represents slander, speaking falsely. Going back to the primordial snake, the first snake in the Garden of Eden, that he spoke wrongly, he slandered to get Adam and Eve to sin, basically is what it goes back to. He, the snake introduced, in many ways, he's considered that which introduced sin into the world, the snake. So very, definitely not a favorite of um, in our stories, in our history. So all these snakes came and they bit people and people with venomous snakes and they died that and the Jewish people realized like, oh, turn to Moshe, we've sinned, we've done wrong. So Moshe dominated for them and it's just proof of how wholeheartedly Moshe didn't just forgive them, but his forgiveness of them was so complete that he also dominated for them. So we just thought, oh no, it's fine. And also I'll go out of my way to pray for you. And um, Hashem told him that you got to make make a snake and put it on the staff kind of thing. And you stick it among all the people and tell them to look look at the snake and that's going to cure them. And it's obviously, it's also symbolic of the fact of like, look up, right? Look up God above, look up in the spiritual sense and really cleanse yourself from the sin and the slander and that will heal you. And Moshe made a snake out of copper because the word, the Hebrew word for a snake is nachash and it's got the same letters as the word for copper, which is nachoshes, nachoshet. So that's that. Now we resume with the journey. They journeyed now, the Jewish people journeyed again, and they ended up east, in the desert east of the land of Moab. And here again, they were not allowed to conquer it, but they had to go around it. And they ended up in this place, now there's going to be this miracle from the Arnon Gorge. So you have this, this tract of land where there were these caves up on one side, and on the other side there was kind of like these cliffs and these rock protrusions. So there's a lot of nations that they're trying to avoid and the ones that aren't going to let them. That uh, they're getting, there's a whole you know, there's a whole mishmash going on here. So you have there's one people that's called the, called the Ammonites, and they're like, no, you're not allowed to mess with them, you gotta skirt them. But then there's another people called the Am the Amorites. The Ammonites. Wait a second. Um, the Amorites. And they are like, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna hide up in the caves, and when the Jewish people pass through this gorge. Where the Iron River is flowing into the, red, the, the Dead Sea, and then there's a gorge there, whatever. When they pass through there, we're going to attack them from above, and we're going to we're going to do them in. And so they go to hide up there in the gorge, and God caused a miracle that the lands kind of shifted. You have this like trembling that occurred, and the lands shifted, and the protrusions that were on one side stuck into the caves on the other side. So kind of like the puzzle pieces locked into place, and it smashed all the people who were hiding there. And there was a miracle that occurred that they were basically God made sure that they were able to see the pieces of the dead, of the corpses, of the dead bodies, so they could understand what happened. Because God made this all occur even before the Jewish people passed through. So they were not attacked at all. It was a preemptive miracle that occurred. And the Jewish people um, sang great praises. They sang a song of praise for God for saving them from the Amorites. Now the Torah portion ends off with the battle against Sihon and Og. So Sihon and Og were two mighty kings, giants, in the literal sense, and Sichon was the king of the Amorites. This is now El of 2487. So we're very close to entry into the land of Israel. So Sichon is the king of the Amorites, and Moshe sends messengers to say, you know, let us pass through. We're not going to touch anything. You know, we're not even going to touch our own food. We'll purposely buy food from you. We're not even going to drink our own water. We're going to pay for you for your water, etc. And Sichon said, not only did he say no, but he's like, not only am I going to say no, he's, take, he's going to take out an army. He gathered an army to go fight the Jewish people. Part of it was that because Sihon was such a giant of a person, and you had Og, also a giant of a person, both kings, a different part of this Amorite land, they say that the Canaanite kings paid them tribute to protect them. Like, you are the first wall to make sure nobody passes through to get to us. So Sihon gathered his army, went and attacked the Jewish people, and... They, they were victorious and they conquered his land. So not just one, but this is the first land conquering that occurs. And then Og, this is about a month later, the 23rd of Tishrei. This is now already the year 2488. This is going to be the year that they enter the land of Israel. So even though it's about only about, it's about two months later or something, a month and a half later, but it's now technically after Rosh Hashanah. So it's the next year. Og, who was the king of Bashan, um, he was also going to come after the Jewish people. And it just says that Moshe took this, Moshe, who was 10 almost tall, took an axe that was 10 almost tall, and he jumped 10 almost, and basically all he reached was Og's, Og's ankle. But he smashed his ankle, and he, and he toppled him, and he killed him. And now again, the Jewish people 
were, are victorious again and they conquered this territory that Og was king over. And this is where the Torah portion ends, which also sets up the Torah portion of next week, which is all about how Balak wants Bilam to curse the Jewish people after he sees what's been going on here.